In this video, we're going to start to look at the chemistry of alkanes. It's very limited chemistry, um, and we'll discuss the reasons why that chemistry is limited. So remember when we say an alkane, we mean, or at least in this video, we mean an, a saturated hydrocarbon. So saturated means it has maximum number of hydrogen atoms. We have single bonds, so each carbon atom is, has a single bond to either another carbon or a hydrogen. And um, I'm ignoring any heteroatoms, any atoms that are not hydrogen or carbon, so it's a true hydrocarbon. So essentially, the chemistry is combustion. So combustion is when you take, um, for example, when you take um, a, a f well, a combustion essentially means burn. So we may as well just write burn here because that's what we're talking about. So for example, if you take octane, which essentially is gasoline, so C8, H18, we take octane, which would be a liquid. We would add molecular oxygen to this. So combustion means take a fuel, add oxygen, and you essentially, if you have a hydrocarbon, you always make carbon dioxide and water. So combustion essentially means add oxygen atoms to everything that's not already oxygen. So if I've got a hydrocarbon, which is a mixture of carbon and hydrogen, and I add oxygen to it, I would add oxygen to carbon to make carbon dioxide in the distinctive one to two uh, Joseph Proust definite proportion. And if I add oxygen to hydrogen, I would make water in the characteristic two to one Joseph Proust definite proportion. Now I just need to balance this equation uh, you would always balance an equation, but this essentially is the is what combustion would look like. Hydrocarbon, oxygen, CO2, and water. We have eight carbons over here, so I need to put a coefficient eight here. We have 18 hydrogens over here, so I'd have to go back and put a nine over here. The nine hits the two, so now I have 18. But my oxygens are not balanced at, at present. So the eight hits that two, so I have 16 oxygen here, plus an extra nine, 16 plus nine is 25. So I'd need to put a 12.5 here. The 12.5 hits the two and makes 25. So now it's balanced, I've obeyed conservation of mass law, but it's unsightly because of the fraction. So by convention, we scale through to get rid of that fraction. So I would make this one a two. I'd make this 12.5 a 25. I'd make this 18, this eight a 16. And I'd make this nine an 18. Okay, so it's balanced. I have whole numbers of mole coefficients and this is the way typically you would present your final answer. So this is our combustion. Um, so essentially, this is the um, this is the chemistry of alkanes, at least the chemistry that we'll discuss at this GOB level. What you notice is that hydrocarbons are essentially a low value chemical. Anything that you set fire to, you don't value that commodity. Um, we're essentially using um, alkanes as fuels. So that seems to be what humans use alkanes for as fuels. Um, so for example, gasoline that most people use in an internal combustion engine, that would be an alkane. Diesel fuel, that's an alkane. Kerosene used as a jet fuel, that's an alkane. Natural gas of any description, that would be alkanes. Um, they have a low value, so we just set fire to them and we release the energy uh, from that combustion reaction. So that essentially is all, pretty much all of the chemistry that we need for alkanes. 
Um, there's one additional type of chemistry that I want to look at. Um, we need more than just a basic hydrocarbon to do that though. Um, so I'm going to, um, well, actually, before we look at that, let's stick with hydrocarbons for now. Let's look at some of the physical properties of alkanes, and then we'll move on to something a bit more exotic than a basic hydrocarbon. So physical properties. Alkanes. So chemically, we just set fire to them and use them generally as a fuel. Physical properties, well, we know that they only contain carbon and hydrogen. And the carbon, so they either contain carbon carbon bonds or carbon hydrogen bonds. But both of these bonds are. Uh, non-polar. So I'm actually going to find another pen. So I can't find a better pen, so I'm going to use this one. So these are both non-polar. And recall they're non-polar because the difference in electronegativities is below a threshold value. So here the difference in electronegativity is zero because you're bonded with something that's identical to you. And here it's around 0.4 electronegativity units. It's less than the 0.5 threshold that's commonly used. So neither one of these bonds are polar. And if this is the constituent bonds present in hydrocarbons, then the entire structure of hydrocarbons is nonpolar as well. So if you're nonpolar, if we consider the intermolecular forces that might be present in hydrocarbons, so IMF here stands for uh, intermolecular forces, then do we have iron dipole? No, because I have no polar structure, so I have no dipole and I have no iron, so no iron dipole. Do I have hydrogen bonding? Nope, because although I have hydrogen, recall from the intermolecular force video that to have a hydrogen bond, you have to have a hydrogen that's activated by being connected directly to a fluorine, an oxygen, or a nitrogen. Hydrogen connected to a carbon is not activated, so it's not a valid hydrogen, it's not a hydrogen eligible for hydrogen bonding. Do I have dipole-dipole forces? Uh, no, because I don't have any polarity, so I don't have a dipole, and I certainly don't have two. So the only type of bonding I have are London dispersion forces. That's the only type of intermolecular force. Remember that the gateway to entry into the London Dispersion Club are the presence of electrons. Yes, hydrocarbons have electrons because carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms have electrons. Hydrocarbons are the sum of those atoms, so therefore hydrocarbons have electrons. And we know that these are the weakest of the intermolecular forces. We know that London Dispersion Forces, I'm going to call it London dispersion forces are proportional to the number of electrons. So essentially, the more atoms you have, the longer your hydrocarbon chain, the more atoms you have, the more electrons you have, the more electrons you have, the more London dispersion forces you have. So we can see if a hydrocarbon generally, or an alkane hydrocarbon is Cn, H2N plus 2. So that's our generic structure for an alkane. Okay, CNH2N plus 2. Um, then we know that London dispersion forces 
are proportional essentially to n. Because the bigger n is, the more carbons you have, the more hydrogens you have, the more the, the higher n, right? So the more n, the higher the numerical value of n, the more atoms, the more atoms, the stronger the London dispersion forces. So you could be asked to identify intermolecular forces in an alkane. You could be asked reasonably to, given a, a three or four alkanes, which of the following has the greatest intermolecular forces. And you would essentially be looking for the greatest numerical value n here in your template structure for an alkane. Um, unless we add atoms other than carbon and hydrogen, this is all we need to know at this GOB level introductory chemistry stage about alkanes. Um, so I'm going to move forward now, tidy up this board, and we will um, start to introduce atoms other than carbon and hydrogen. There's a type of chemistry we can do on alkanes provided that the right atoms are present in the alkane to begin with. And that's called uh, Zaitsev elimination. The word elimination uh, means eliminate or remove. So we're going to remove something from an alkane. Zaitsev was the person that coined this type of chemistry, uh, the surname of the scientist. So atoms that are able to reasonably easily be removed are atoms that are reasonably stable once removed. So let's have a look at water. So we're going to call this dehydrogenation. Actually, dehydration, sorry, if it's water. Dehydration. Dehydration. So dehydration here just means remove water. Okay, so let's have an alkane. We'll just do the full structure of our alkane here. And let's add an OH and an H. So this essentially is going to be the water that we're going to lose. Let's put H's everywhere else. So here it's not a hydrocarbon because I've got oxygen. Um, uh, this type of chemical is actually an alcohol. Um, not especially interested in alcohols in this video. It's an alcohol all because it has an OH, a hydroxide, um, bonded on it. So anyway, that's not the focus of what we want. What we're going to look at is we want to remove water, but we have an option. We can either remove water on these two carbon atoms, H2O, or we can lose water on these two carbon atoms. So I'm going to call this A and B. And clearly, if we removed water based on these two options, we get two different products. So let's consider what B would give us. Let's also consider what A would give us. So we've got two separate pathways, A and B. Well, if we lost water from A, we'd have a double bond between these two carbons. So that would give us just so we can follow my diagram, I guess. So I've lost the H here. I've lost the OH here. 
and that's my H2O. I've got my hydrogens everywhere else. That would be the product of, of losing water from A. If I lost water from B, I'd have the double bond right at the end. So I would have Okay, so I've got two different products. I know they're two different products because they have two different names. Remember, we've already looked at naming. Um, interestingly, I would have to, uh, this chemical if this formed would be capable of cis-trans isomerization because the two carbon atoms of the double bond have two different atoms on it. This has a, a methyl group. This has a hydrogen. Likewise, this has a hydrogen. This has a methyl. So I'm not going to name them right now because then it would introduce the, well, is it cis or trans? But we can see that this, they would both be butenes. Um, they would both be capable of cis, they would both have to be identified as the cis or the trans. Um, but the top one from path A would be uh, a 2-butene, a cis or a trans 2-butene. And the chemical from path B would be a cis or a trans. Actually, no, it wouldn't. So the bottom one wouldn't, right? Because that carbon has two hydrogens. So the bottom one wouldn't need the cis-trans label. But it would be a 1-butene. In fact, it would just be 1-butene. Okay. So not only can we do something other than combustion now with a slightly more exotic alkane, so not no longer a hydrocarbon now, but still an al, um, still definitely got features of an alkane. Um, I've got something on the alkane that that uh, activates it, allows it to uh, lose something, undergo elimination. So this variation of an alkane is now called an alcohol. So technically it's not really an alkane anymore, but I wanted for my students to make that link between it's it's a substituted alkane. So the alkane is the bare backbone and I've now accessorized this alkane. Um, I've jazzed it up a little bit with something exotic like an oxygen um, and now I've called it an alcohol because clearly it can do things that regular alkanes can't do. Um, so I can regenerate these alkenes by losing water in a dehydration, but which one do I form? Do I form both? Do I form one of them? Well, Zaitsev realized that you only form one of them and we'll call it the Zaitsev product. Um, we form the Zaitsev product and the anti-Zaitsev product and the Zaitsev product is what's formed on the majority of occasions. Um, and that's the one we'll assume is formed unless stated otherwise. The anti zeta product is the other product other than the zeta product. So essentially what Zaitsev's rule says that predicts which product is formed under Zaitsev elimination is that you want the double bond or the double bond is likely to form between carbons of highest um, of highest character. So what do I mean by character? Um, so I have to give you a little aside on the character or the degree of carbons. So we have primary, or I'll just write first degree. We have secondary or second degree. We have tertiary or third degree and we have quaternary 
or fourth degree. Okay, a primary carbon is a carbon that's bonded to one other carbon only. A carbon atom is primary if it's bonded essentially to three hydrogen and only one other carbon. And in organic chemistry, we would represent that extra carbon as the letter R. R is a, a convenient tool in organic chemistry. It essentially means carbon plus other stuff that's of no consequence right now. So it just lets the chemist know if there's a carbon atom there with a bunch of other stuff. Don't worry about it. Focus. It's something I don't want you to focus on. So this would be a primary carbon. A secondary carbon is a carbon that's bonded to two hydrogen and two other carbons, so R, R. The R's can be the same. They could be different. If I just write R, I'm telling you it's the same. If I want you to know that these R's are different, I could just call one of them R prime, and that would indicate that they're different. A tertiary carbon is a carbon that's got one hydrogen and three carbons, so three R's. And finally, a quaternary, as you might expect, is a carbon with four other carbons bonded to it. They can be the same, they could be different. I could have prime, double prime, triple prime, and unprimed if they were all different. So essentially, Zaitsev said that you, the Zaitsev product is formed between carbons with the highest degree. So let's have a look. Let's label our degrees of carbons in the potential products. If I formed, if I followed path A and formed product A, then this carbon has only one of the carbons. So this carbon is a primary carbon. Okay. This second carbon here has one, two carbons bonded to it. So that's a secondary carbon or a second degree carbon. This third carbon likewise has two carbons bonded to it, so it's secondary. And this terminal carbon has only one other carbon bonded to it, so it's primary. So in this product, I would form the double bond between two secondary carbons. The other option here is I've got primary, primary, this carbon is secondary, this carbon is primary. So I don't know how my red pen is holding up. I'm going to go over in black. because My red pen is seeking an early retirement. Okay, so following this procedure, we've identified the degree or the hierarchy of carbons. So the choices between second degree and first or between two seconds Two seconds are higher degrees than a second and a first. So this would be, well, this would be the Zeta product. This would be the major product. And in GOB, we're going to assume that means the only product. This would be the anti zeta product, the minor product. We're going to assume at the GOB level that this won't be formed. So it's reasonable that you can be asked at this level, predict the product formed from this reaction, this dehydration, um, and you would have to follow something like this to identify the zeta product. In this second example of Zaitsev elimination, I've just added one extra carbon here. And in doing so, I've created a plane of symmetry in the molecule. So with the oxygen on the third carbon along, the left side of this molecule is identical to the right side. And so if I had the same option, 
of losing water as path A or water as path B, I'd get exactly the same product because of the plane of symmetry in the molecule. So if I ignore the hydrogens for now, and I just look at where these double bonds would be, path A would give the double bond between carbons two and three, and path B would give the double bond between carbons three and four, which when renamed would then become two and three. So these would be exactly the same structure. So although Zaitsev rule is always in effect, you don't always have a Zaitsev product. Here, the Zaitsev product and the anti-Zaitsev product are exactly the same. Um, so you want to have a look out for symmetry in the molecule initially to see a lack of differentiation of products finally. There's several classes of Zaitsev elimination that I would like uh, my students to be aware of at the GOB level. Uh, dehydration, which we've looked at, dehydro, dehydrogenation, which we will look at now, dehalogenation, which we'll look at now, and dehydrohalogenation. So dehydration is the loss of water as HOH. So you're going to lose an H atom from one carbon and a hydroxide OH from another uh, carbon atom. Dehydrogenation, you're going to lose hydrogen. So you're going to lose an H2 molecule as an H on one carbon and an H on another carbon. Halogenation, well a halogen could either be F2 Cl2, Br2, or I2, they're in group 17, the halogens. So you're going to lose X2, where X is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, as XX. Now, it could be the same halogen, or you could have X, X prime, where they're two different halogens. So you could have FF, or you could have FCL. So they don't have to be the same halogen. They could be different halogens, indicated by the prime, but they would be halogens. And dehydrohalogenation here is going to be loss of HX, where X is a halogen, so X is F, Cl, Br, or I, and that would just be H, X. So again, you lose H from one carbon, X from an adjacent carbon. Um, essentially exactly the same process as dehydration. Um, Let's clear the board, maybe look at um, a quick example, and then we'll move on to something else. So we've already looked at the hydration, the loss of water. So we'll just have a look, trivial look at dehydrogenation, the loss of hydrogen, dehalogenation, the loss of a halogen, either a homodiatomic or a heterodiatomic as shown here. And finally, dehalogenation, dehydrohalogenation, loss of hydrogen and a halogen. Um, at this level, we're not really interested in the mechanism needed to make this happen or what reagents are needed. We just want to recognize the type of chemistry happening when we see it. So let's, for argument's sake, say that we're going to lose these two hydrogen, um, which if I specifically wanted to would be tricky but that's for another course, then you just have to remember when you lose, essentially when you make the compound unsaturated, remember when we have a, a multiple bond, we've essentially made the compound unsaturated. We have to put the 
um, double bond in there. So the double bond would be here. I'm going to go ahead and just write the skeletal structure. We've introduced skeletal structures already. Um, so it's always good just to practice skeletal structures. So that would be my skeletal structure plus H2, where the double bond is between these two carbons. Here, again, I would form a double bond between those two carbons, and I'd have FCL. If I lost these two, there's my double bond. And then finally, remember from Zaitsev elimination, um, you could potentially lose these two or these two, but we want to maximize the, the degrees of the carbons, or we want to have the double bond form between the highest degree carbons. So remember here, we've got a primary carbon. It's a carbon bonded to only one other carbon. Here we have a secondary carbon. Here we have a secondary carbon. And here we have a primary. So rather form a double bond between a primary and a secondary, we'll instead form the double bond between a secondary and a secondary, which would give us exactly the same product as these have given us, and we'd have HBr. So again, um, at this GOB level, I would say less emphasis on what chemical is needed to make this happen, um, more of an emphasis on what's the type of chemistry um, I've eliminated, I've followed a rule, I've gone from a saturated structure with single bonds to an unsaturated structure with at least one multiple bond. A reaction that's kind of the antithesis of Zaitsev elimination, although not exactly a reversal, is called Markovnikov's addition. Whereas elimination means removal from, addition obviously means adding to. Markovnikov is the professor who this um, is coined after. So instead of eliminating from a saturated structure to give an unsaturated structure, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to take an unsaturated structure and add to the double bond. And the way we would phrase it is we add across the double bond. So rather than dehydration, let's look, have a look at hydration, which means we add water. So we can take, um, let's start with skeletal and let's get practicing with our skeletal structures. So let's take a nice um, double bond here and let's add water across it. Well, essentially, we could just add that as HOH, and we can form an interaction between one of the carbons of the double bond and another of the carbons of the double bond. And we would therefore lose the, um, the double bond, so go from a an unsaturated structure to a saturated structure. Um, and that would be in this case, we've got an alkene is going to give an alcohol. Um, so clearly we've added the water across to make an alcohol. Just as with carbons, we can have primary, secondary, and tertiary and quaternary. With alcohols, it's good at this stage if we start to look at the hierarchy of alcohol. So let's have a quick look at uh, the alcohol family. We can have primary or first degree. Well, that's a carbon 
with its alcohol. So the carbon, an alco alcoholic carbon, is a carbon that's bonded to an OH. If it's primary, it's bonded only to one other carbon, so it must have two H's on it. Okay, so the carbon that has the OH on it, the alcoholic carbon, has one other carbon, which we've called R. A secondary alcohol, or a second degree alcohol, the alcoholic carbon is bonded to two other carbons. They can be the same or different. You can indicate different with a prime and one hydrogen. A tertiary alcohol or third degree alcohol has the alcoholic carbon bonded to three other carbons. They can be the same or different. Clearly there is no such thing as a quaternary alcohol because the fourth spot on the carbon has to be occupied by the OH. It can't therefore be occupied by a fourth carbon. So with alcohols, we only have primary, secondary, and tertiary. So in this case, we formed an alcohol, but we know that this carbon that contains the OH, it's bonded to one, two other carbons. So this is a secondary alcohol. Later on, uh, when we look at some of the chemistry of alcohols in a subsequent video, probably not in this video, knowing which type of alcohol you have will be important because that will dictate what type of chemistry comes next. Okay, so this has been a quick look at hydration. Um, let's look at uh, some other types of Markovnikov addition. So, in this video, we've already looked at hydration, the addition of water. The, uh, essentially, the, types, the other types of addition that I want us to be aware of are essentially the opposite of what was looked at uh, in the elimination. So we had dehydration, now we look at hydration. We had dehydrogenation, now we look at hydration. Uh, hydrogenation, sorry, where we add... Um, a hydrogen molecule, that would just give us the alkane. We can add halogens. Here I've got Cl2, but you could have essentially X2, where X is either F, Cl, Br, or I. And they can be X2 without the primes or X, X prime. So you can have a heterodiatomic halogen molecule or you can have a homodiatomic halogen molecule but essentially you would form uh, the alkane with halogen so this would be uh, just a halo alkane um, and then here we could add HCl. And again, a halo alkene. So what we haven't done, I've just realized, we haven't looked at the Markovnikov's rule. So just like we can have elimination and then we can emphasize Zaitsev's rule about elimination, so far, we've just looked at addition, but we haven't really specified what Markovnikov noticed about addition. So let's clear the board and let's, let's spend a few minutes looking at that. Okay, so in this particular example, we're going to do uh, hydration. So we're going to add water across the double bond. And we're going to focus on exactly what Markovnikov noticed about hydration uh, and about addition in general, not just hydration. So essentially what it boils down to is that the carbon of the double bond with the most H's gets any H that's available. Uh, so Markovnikov is, the rule is always in effect, but you don't always notice a Markovnikov product. 
Um, it depends if the Markovnikov and the Antin Markovnikov product are the same, and then you won't notice that one of them is a product at all. Um, and it all boils down to the symmetry of the unsaturated compound to begin with. To really see Markovnikov's rule, you need an asymmetric um, chemical that's being added, and you need an asymmetric um, unsaturated structure. So what do I mean by asymmetric? I mean different sides. So water is asymmetric because we've got an H and an OH and these two sides are not the same. So we've got asymmetry. Check. And then this structure here, if we just look at the double bond, I've got my skeletal structure here, but this carbon is this carbon. And I know in a skeletal structure, we don't bother with hydrogens. Let's put them back in so we can see exactly what we have. So I've got two hydrogens on this carbon, but on this carbon, I only have one hydrogen and then another carbon with two hydrogens and a third carbon with three hydrogens. So if I look at the two carbons of the double bond, clearly this side is different than this side. So again, I have asymmetry. And essentially, you will notice Markovnikov's rule manifesting if you have two lots of asymmetry, one on each chemical. So I have that here, so I'm definitely going to see Markovnikov's rule playing out. Markovnikov's rule, remember, says that the side, the carbon with the most H's to begin with, gets the H. So this H in water is going to go to this carbon because this carbon has two hydrogens bonded directly to it, whereas this carbon only has one hydrogen bonded directly to it. It's not correct to look at all these other hydrogens because yes this carbon has many hydrogens the problem is they're not bonded directly to it they're bonded to adjacent carbons so you have to look at the carbons in the double bond themselves we're not going to look at the stage of the rationale behind this uh, we're just going to look at observing the fact that there is a rule called Kovnikov's rule that's in the background. We're going to learn how to predict the product and we're not going to worry about the mechanisms or the strategy or the rationale behind it. Um, that would be for a higher level organic chemistry course. But again, to reiterate, carbon, two H's, carbon, one directly bonded H. This clearly has more H's, so it will preferentially get that H. So if we look at our two options, let's, let's say that that H goes here for the first option. That means the OH would go on the second carbon. If I flipped it round and I allowed the oxygen to go on this carbon, then I would have, let's see, what would I have? Okay, so they're my two options. Either the oxygen is on the second carbon or the oxygen is on the first carbon. We've already said that Markovnikov says when you have two lots of asymmetry the, and you have a hydrogen, the hydrogen goes on the carbon with the most hydrogens, which would give us this one. So this is the Markovnikov product. This is the major product. We'll assume the only product, although that's not strictly true. We'll assume it's generally true at the GOB level. The other minor, we'll assume negligible. Is the anti-Markovnikov product. Um, 
Now, there are occasions that we certainly don't have to worry about where you will get the anti-Malkovnikov product, but not at this level. So we will assume that this is a rule that is going to tell us which is the only product we get, and uh, we'll acknowledge that that's an oversimplification, but so long as we acknowledge a priori it's an oversimplification, uh, we won't be deluded into thinking that's the end of the story. It's the beginning of a story um, that we won't finish at the GOB level, but we'll at least be aware of this should we encounter it moving forward. Um, so that's Mark Kovnikov's edition. Um, to conclude this video, um, I'm going to clear the board and then we'll convince each other that Mark Kovnikov's edition and Zaitsev elimination are not just antitheses of each other. So if you go from a saturated structure to unsaturated, if you do the reverse chemistry, you don't necessarily get the same product. So I'll try and illustrate that um, in the next in the next board. Okay, so in this board, I'm going to try and convince you that Zaitsev elimination is not just one over Mark Kovnikov's addition. So you can go from Zaitsev elimination goes from um, a saturated structure to an unsaturated. But if you were to do a Zaitsev elimination and then try and reverse that with Markovnikov, you don't necessarily get back to the original structure. So let's see an example. So here I'm just going to be dealing with skeletal structures. So we have this saturated structure. It's an alcohol. Uh, we know if we look at this carbon here, we know that the alcoholic carbon, the oxygen, makes this the alcoholic carbon. It's got one, two, three. So we know that this is a tertiary alcohol. Let's see if we can uh, remove water. So we'll undergo a dehydration, which means we're going to lose a water molecule. Now, we can either lose water, we need an adjacent carbon with a hydrogen, so I can either lose a hydrogen here, and essentially the two products I can get um, are going to be either, let's see, this. So if I lost a hydrogen here, I'd form a double bond between these two. Uh, and then I'd be left with just my two methyl groups here. And then I would have water. Or I could lose a hydrogen from one of these methyl groups. It doesn't matter which one. And then I would form the double bond here. So they're the two possible structures. Again, I have no choice but to lose the OH from that carbon, but I could either form the double bond here by losing one of these H's, or lose the make form a double bond here by losing one of these H's. There are my two products. If I look at Zaitsev's rule now, Zaitsev says that you form the double bond preferentially between carbons that have a higher degree. Well, let's see what I have. This carbon is bonded to um, only one of the carbon, so that's a primary carbon. This carbon is bonded to one, two, three, so that's a tertiary carbon. So in this product, I've formed a double bond between a primary and a tertiary. Here, this carbon is bonded to one, two, three, so that's a tertiary. This carbon is bonded to 1, 2, that's a secondary. So given the choice between forming a double bond between secondary and tertiary versus tertiary and primary, this is going to be the higher overall degrees. So this is my zeta product. We'll assume at this level it's the only product and we'll assume that we don't form the anti-Zeta product. 
So if my statement is true here, then if we do a Markovnikov, a Markovnikov addition here, we shouldn't get the same product necessarily. So let's go ahead and take our ZTEP product. And let's see if we can add the water back again. So we'll do a hydration. So we're going to add water back again. Well, here I've got to look at the double bond. This carbon of the double bond has two carbons and zero H's bonded directly. But this carbon clearly has an H bonded directly to it. So the H in my water, remember I'm treating water as an H and an OH, then clearly the H is going to go where there's already an H, and the O is going to go where there's currently no H. So given the two options, well, I'll look at the option that we get, uh, which would be to have the, let's see, the H would be the, O would be here. Or okay, so these are my two options. Then actually, um, given the choice between these two, it looks like on this occasion, I would generate, so that's that's unfortunate, but we'll make this a teachable moment. So I said it's not always equal to this, so I guess I found an example where it just coincidentally is equal to it. So we can see that the H, the carbon with the most H's gets the H, so on this occasion, this would be the Markovnikov product. Okay, so on this occasion, we have regenerated the same structure. Okay, let's tweak it so that we actually show what I'm trying to show you, and that it's not a guaranteed fact that you'll always generate the same structure. Okay, so let's tweak this a little bit. So that's, we've got some evidence that you can generate the same structure again. Um, we can make this a false statement if we can find just one example where you don't generate the same structure. Then we've made it a coincidence. Okay, so let's, let's see if we can slightly tweak the structure and find an example. Um, and I believe if I were to initially change the starting structure and have a methyl group here, I think this will show you what I'm trying to show you and that it's definitely not a given that you get the same structure. So let's go ahead. Again, we can either form a double bond here if we lose OH and an H from this carbon, which we know is not going to work because then we'll have a primary carbon. Preferentially, we'll lose an H from here and form um, a double bond with a higher degree. So we know that the Zetes have product is going to form a double bond here. So this will be our ZTEP product. Again, the double bond here rather than here. So we definitely disfavor terminal double bonds. If we then start off, balance it. If we then start off with our ZTEP product, and we were to try and hydrate back again, well now we've got a carbon with two carbons and we've got a carbon with an H. Well now the H is gonna go here. So there's our water structure. We're gonna have the H going up here because it's got the most H's. So now you can see that the oxygen is hopscotched, 
instead of being on this carbon again, it's now moved down to this carbon as our Markovnikov product. Um, this would have given us the anti-Markovnikov product. So here we have the Markovnikov product. The anti-Markovnikov product, which we'll assume that we don't see, would have been the original again. This would be the anti Markovnikov product. We'll assume that we don't see any of that. So, as you can see, the first example I did, we can clearly see that you can generate the same structure again. But we found one example, and there are many more, where you don't get the same structure again. So we can confidently say that Zetsev elimination is not just the inverse of Markovnikov addition. So you have to be very careful about that. The only other thing I'll say before we conclude this video is that we started looking at the chemistry of alkanes. We said that they undergo combustion which essentially means you burn them and you generate energy that you can, you, you know, via the conservation of energy laws, we can convert that into different types of energy. Um, these hydrocarbon alkanes, um, very simple structures, not the chemical diversity needed to do a large array of interesting chemistry on them. So we burn them and, and we call it a day. Alkenes can also undergo combustion they can generate, you know, they're a source of carbon and hydrogen. They can form CO2 and water. But practically, you would never use an alkene as a fuel because there's, there's so much more chemistry you can do with them. Um, so to use an alkene as a fuel would be to underuse the potential of these chemicals to do something else. So alkenes are a much more expensive type of chemical, much more diverse type of chemical because of that factor that they have a double bond and you can add things to them and you can generate them by, if you had things other than hydrogen and carbon, you can um, generate these double bonds. So they become a much more versatile type of chemical.